Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me to share your President's Award Day, which is a real delight. I'm slightly too small to stand behind the podium. Did you notice that? I'll, so I'll stand to one side, probably, and put the mic. Excellent. Perfect. So I work at Oxford Brookes University. I'm head of the Oxford Centre for Staff and Learning Development. So I run the team of educational developers and staff and organisational developers. And our unit serves Oxford Brookes University, but also the sector nationally and internationally. So we have both an internal and an external remit, and that's really important. And one of the things that we've done is been involved in e-learning research over the last 10 or 15 years, and particularly learner experience research which has culminated in the special interest group, ELISIG, uh, which I'm currently chair of, which has about 1,600 members, I think, at last count, which is a, a national group of people who are interested in conducting learner experience research and looking at the outputs of it and making sure that that has impact. So what I wanted to do this morning was to give you a bit of an overview of the 10 years or so of learner experience research and where I think we've got to, and then talk about one of our most recent projects, which is actually working with learners in FE, in the 16 to 19 year old age group, uh, mostly a wide age group, but that kind of education, and look at how we're preparing learners for the digital age, how we're working with them and how they're experiencing the technologies that we're providing for them. And I'll give you a clue before I start of the two main things that I'm going to say and the two main things which we found out from this research. Um, one is about understanding digital learning or online learning in a really holistic fashion. So we talked, mentioned uh, e-portfolios uh, earlier in the introduction. And when we've gone out and we've talked to learners and asked them about how they experience e-portfolios, they tell us how difficult it is to borrow dad's laptop or their son's laptop, or the fact that it's got a crack in the screen, or they can't quite work out how to sort out the virus software so that they can upload their own things. We really have to understand it in context. We have to understand how they experience online learning within the context of the discipline as well as their home and the organisation. So, uh, so that's the first thing that I wanted to talk about, was the holistic nature of learning experience. And the second thing I wanted to talk about is how it's really different for everyone. And it's something that we've struggled with a lot in the field, is to say, how do we make sense of all the difference? Every time we go out and talk to learners, they tell us a completely different set of things. How do we try and organise that in order to make any recommendations about what to do on the basis of it? And then I said there were two things, let's go for a third thing. And the third thing, I guess, is the historical perspective of how things are changing and how we react to that. So I'll get the book plugs in right at the beginning. So uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is summed up in this pair of books. But it's also quite interesting how things have changed. So the first one, Rethinking Pedagogy for a Digital Age, was first published in 2007. And it was all about design for learning. And it was all about, some of you are nodding, which is great, familiar with it. <laughs> and it was about... Um, how we prepare our courses in such a way that they prepare our learners for a digital age. And then the second uh, collection, uh, both edited collections, is about how are learners responding to all the design work that we've done. And that was quite a shift in emphasis and understanding for us. And then, of course, we have to go back and revise the first one, which is now in its second edition, in response to what we found out about learner experience. So uh, a lot of, if you want to follow up on any of this, a lot of this is represented in those two things. So I wanted to tell you about my granddad's piano to start. Um, unexpectedly, about 12 years ago, when my granddad died, uh, I was left this in his will. Um, and in, when it arrived in the van from Northampton, uh, the piano stool was also with it, which was completely packed full of sheet music and old books and things. And after I had given away a lot of the sheet music and the books, to people who could actually play the piano, I, <laughs> I was looking through some of the things that was left. And I wanted to read you the foreword from this one. So this is called Music in the Home, and it was published in 1932. And the foreword uh, is written by Sir Landon Ronald. And he says, Statistics prove that the sale of music of every kind and description, excepting perhaps dance music, is so seriously on the wane that publishers are inclined to fight shy of bringing out new songs or pianoforte pieces when they know there will be scarcely any sale for them. 
So why might that be so? Why is the sale of sheet music in 1932 going down so much? What has brought about this state of affairs? I fear there is but one answer. The habit of listening to music instead of performing it. This is to be so deeply deplored and is so damaging to the progress and development of a beautiful art that it is up to all music lovers to do what they can to prevent it from spreading. <laughs> How did they do? No? Anyone got iPods? iPod headphones? No. All right. And goes on to explain what's in the book. And then the bottom says, if this book assists to revive the desire of self-performance, which is innate in most of us, then the aim and object of this book and its editor will have been achieved. Isn't that fabulous? Beautifully written. Fabulous. Lots of interesting things in there. I, I need to find something about um, uh, the advent of the gramophone and how it was going to be a wonderful, revolutionised progress. I'm sure there is a positive side, rhetoric, at the same time as that one. But there are different reactions to the progress that technology offers. So that's one thing to say, is that, you know, that's a real emotional reaction to what's going on. But the other thing that it says quite interestingly, and it doesn't mention gramophone at all in that forward, it, what it mentions is habits. It changes our habits. It changes what we do. And this is something we've talked to learners about an awful lot. And I wanted just to um, play you a little bit of uh, a video here, if I can find it, when we go out and talk to learners about... So um, I've done a lot of work with the GISC over the years, and uh, this is actually taken from last year's Year 12 to 2013 Summer of Innovation. It's quite a long video, but I'm literally just going to play you the first uh, minute and a half or so of students talking about how they experience the digital environment. I'm probably quite disorganised when it comes to keeping notes and things. And because I'll, I'll put some on my tablet and I'll put some on my phone and I'll flag up a few emails I know I need to read, which I never read, and then I read it again when I get the reminder email. Um, I think it just differs from student to student, but um, I haven't found anything that's sort of transferable. We have um, like a Moodle um, and we had a, like, a workspace at the university and these other online systems that they have. and. Um, I don't find any of them very useful. I use like Mendeley, um, yeah. like reference management stuff. Mm. That's like it's like say if you look to type, the software is incredibly useful, but you have to find it specific for your task. But I guess people have to be aware of what is out there to actually uh, try these things out. It's always really, really interesting to talk to learners about what they do. And the first one there, talking about, uh, not about the technology, but about how they manage it and the kind of habits that they have and the strategies they have for managing their email. And then uh, coming back later, I don't know if you noticed, and said, oh, and the institution provides all sorts of stuff, you know, Moodle and Loop and things that you've invested greatly in, um, but I don't bother with any of that. Well, that's not really important to me. So institutions are making massive investment in all sorts of technology and learner experience research is really trying to make sense of uh, how do learners, how do we understand how learners experience all these infrastructure and services and systems that we're providing for them in ways that we can improve them. So what I think I'll do is I'm going to run you through fairly quickly a little potted history of the last 10 years or so of learner experience research just to make sure we're, we're all kind of on the same page with this. And then I want to tell you in a little bit more detail about the uh, most recent GIST project that I've been involved in, as I said, the FE one, and talk a little bit more about that. So what do we know so far about how learners experience um, education in the digital age? So I started working in this area in about 2005 uh, on a series of projects that were funded by the GISC and Oxford Brooks was responsible for the support and synthesis of a number of funded projects. So we had the role of bringing the projects together, uh, synthesizing their findings, disseminating them in a series of national workshops, that kind of things. And these projects were great and really, really exciting at the time, partly because of the methods that they used. So one of the things that they did was give students video cameras to take into their bedrooms and do that kind of Big Brother audio video diary thing, and these are some screen grabs from students speaking into their diaries. And they really brought to life 
a lot of stories that we had never previously heard from students. Uh, so the young woman at the top, and remember this is in 2005-06, was a computing student and talked about uh, what she got from her lessons, but also was one of the very first users of MIT OpenCourseWare and was following courses from MIT as well. A uh, young man in the middle was one of the many who said, I open my laptop as soon as I wake up in the morning. I just have to check my MySpace or Bebo or social media, whatever it was at the time. We had an awful lot of those. And without wanting to stereotype too much, we also had an awful lot of mature learners who just talked mainly about fitting in in their life. But really vivid, really, really vivid use of diaries and logs and made us think about technology use in context. So uncovering student voices we haven't previously heard forcing us to think holistically and in a, in a way that was really contextualized to understand the services that we're providing for them. And as we're all now well aware of, uh, a powerful relationship. We were going out giving conferences at the time. We had this lovely quote about how much I love my iPod. You know, a powerful relationship, an emotional attachment with technology, in particular with social media. Um, another series of studies after that took us a little bit further. And this word habits again, which keeps cropping up in our work, which showed a great variety in what learners are actually doing with the technologies that we're providing for them. And this is when we started to explore the concept of digital literacy as well as design for learning and thinking about that as a social practice. And uh, these, these two studies that Oxford Brooks ran, uh, the Supporting Learners in a Digital Age, which was Slider, the Institutional Case Studies Project, and INSTEP, which was our own internal e-pioneers project introduced us to some of our most confident, agile, digital leaders who were really experimenting with lots of technologies, really surprising us with what they could do. Although they have told us since, these two down the side Oxford Brooks students, that putting E in front of any word, even pioneer, just makes it totally unpalatable to <laughs> students. And we started to run a lot of digital literacy workshops and think about the concept of digital literacy. At the time, we were really excited about this notion of e-pioneers or our most experienced learners, uh, uh, ones who were most imaginative and creative with their use of technology and what we could learn from them. And at the time, I remember going out and saying, you know, five years' time, this is going to be all our learners. We're really going to have to catch up. That hasn't really proved to be the case, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. And in terms of impact, and impact for all, some of the th things that this learner experience research, this digital literacy agenda has given us, is an understanding that although we started going out and talking to learners about uh, Moodle or WebCT or Blackboard as it was in the time, um, and whether they were online students or blended, you know, are you on a fully online course, are you on a partly online course, to them it didn't matter. All learning is technology, technologically mediated. Uh, learners are using their own technologies as well as those that provided for them, uh, right from school upwards to enhance the experience that's provided for them in an organisation. So there's no longer useful to think about a distinction between online or blended or face-to-face -face learning. It just all includes technology. Um, another big impact, I think, has been the understanding of digital literacy as contextualised for the discipline. And in fact, when we've been going out and working with academic staff, when we started talking to them about social media, really difficult to get any kind of discussion or engagement about that. But as soon as you start saying, what does it mean to be a digitally literate chemist, geographer, historian? That's when you start to have really interesting conversations about what's going on and how they have to prepare their learners for being a historian in the digital age. Lots of frameworks, a couple up here, frameworks for staff and student digital literacy development have come out of this work, which are, are useful and, and you may know about. And really, it's been about how the services that we provide, if we understand the learner experience, how then do we target what we do at the learner needs that we've uncovered? And that's what I wanted to explore a little bit this morning, okay? Um, how do we talk about difference in a meaningful way? How do we make use of some of the findings to actually make recommendations that can be useful to us? So I don't want to seem, sound that it's job done. You know, there has been a lot of work. It has taken us somewhere. This is the stuff that we know now. But there are also lots and lots of questions that remain, and I've just put a few of them up here. 
And um, I really just wanted to concentrate today on this first one, although to acknowledge that there are lots of other things going on as well. And I wanted particularly to think about this, this notion of difference. And if all learning is technology mediated and learners experience it very differently, how do we provide courses and services which are going to meet the needs of all our learners? It's terribly complicated. What can we do about that? Um, but there are these other questions which are also going on. I know Ron Barnett is talking a lot at the moment about attributes and you know 21st century attributes. So saying, well, we've talked a lot about skills, we've talked a little bit about practices, but really we need to be thinking about the attributes of successful learners. I think that's an interesting conversation. We have talked a lot with institutions about what are students entitled to when they arrive and what actually is an enhancement, a nice to have activity and where do you draw that line and is it different for every institution? Um, and we're still talking an awful lot about research methods that we can borrow from lots of different disciplines and lots of different uh, research uh, uh, philosophies to keep track of um, the learner experience because every time out, every time we go and talk to learners, we find that it keeps changing and this is something we can't say we now know what the learner experience is like. What we actually have to say is how, it, how is this institution constantly monitoring its learners' experiences because they keep changing. So with that in mind, so sorry, that was a little bit of a kind of race through of where I'm coming from and the kind of research that I've been involved in. And now I want to kind of slow down a little bit and tell you about one particular project. Um, it is from FE. Um, we were asked to undertake it, or did to undertake it for the GIS. I think there's lots and lots of things that we can learn for all sectors of education, not just from FE, but I'll leave you to, to draw those own parallels yourself. Um, and uh, what I wanted to do was to think about this, this concept of difference and meeting all the needs of all the learners and how we can approach that. So the FE sector in, in the UK, when we started working here, um, is absolutely awash with reports telling it what to do. I don't know if you, if you feel like this in the sector that you work, but there's, you know, um, a roadmap for this and a policy for that and an you know, initiative, strategic initiative for something else. Absolutely awash with reports about uh, the digital environment and progress and what's going to happen next. Um, I noticed, coming to this slightly as an outsider, so coming as an HE researcher into a FE, that firstly, most of the reports all the reports, I think, were not research-based. Um, there has been a real lack of research in the sector since about 2007, when some agencies like uh, Bechter and ELSIS were shut down by the government. Uh, and because it's not research-based, people are caught up with the rhetoric of the time. And in particular, in these, to present learners, all learners, as confident, positive, motivated, about the use of technology. And I think this is a, a tendency that we need to be really, really cautious of. So they said things like, um, modern learners, modern learners expect and are familiar with technology and global communication, okay? Uh, the biggest challenge for the sector is the under-exploitation of learners' skills, devices, and technical knowledge. So lots of things like this, not based on, on any particular research. So that was our starting point. At the same time, I have to say, setting really ambitious targets for the sector about how to make use of technology in a short period of time. So we came in, and this project started about this time last year. It's just finished, as in I just submitted the final project report um, yeah, Monday. So um, hot off the press for you. We started uh, with some desk research. We started just looking at what was around in the published literature. Uh, and I put these figures up here for you because we found 23 sector reports that were really interesting, uh, which were about, no, I don't want to say they're really interesting, they were about this topic of uh, digital learning in FE. <laughs> and despite a very extensive traditional academic literature search, we found eight peer-reviewed articles which actually looked at the learner experience in FE, none of which were cited in the 23 sector reports, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> we found hundreds of case studies of teachers' practice, hundreds on things like the Excellence Gateway, um, very teacher-centred, not really exposing learners' views particularly, so we just picked 25, uh, which were, we had most learner experience, and we had access to 
seven institutional documents. So that's kind of um, institutional strategies or their own learning experience research that they'd done. We, we're expecting more than that. We didn't get quite as much as we expected. Um, as, in, as in previous research in HE, when we looked particularly through the case studies, there's a great diversity in experiences, and it's quite difficult to make sense of, of this. We then went out and did some primary research. So we met 220 learners in 12 focus groups in six general further education colleges uh, over a period of a few months. And um, we did kind of card sort exercises with them. So we, we had a whole series of little cards and some of them were about access and some of them were about attributes, some of them about experience. And we asked them, you know, what do you expect your college to provide? Which of these do you use? Sort them in different ways. Um, we photographed everything. We weren't terribly interested in what they put top. We were interested in the conversations that were elicited through this method. But it was a good way of getting the students talking. And then we went out and ran a series of national consultation events with our draft findings and uh, recommendations and get some feedback on what, what was needed in the sector. Um, and lots and lots of data arising from those as well. One of the most interesting things that we found um, was a study called The Learner in Their Context, which was a Bechter-funded study, one of the last ones to be funded, was actually shut down early when Bechter closed, which was run by Chris Davis and Becca Enum from Oxford uh, University, just down the hill from us. And they, over a three-year period, uh, interviewed 132 young people, including 35 home visits. So they'd really picked up on this notion of holistic and contextualised understandings of learners' experience, and that was really important. And if you're interested, they published last year a book called Teenagers and Technology, which is a really nice read, uh, which is about this project. You can also read their, their project reports, The Learner in Their Context. And they provided this spectrum of experience, a way of understanding the experiences of all the different learners that they talked to, a way of helping us to understand difference. So what, what we did in our FE project is we took this spectrum and we mapped a lot of the case studies and things that we found onto it, and we mapped some of our focus group data onto it as well to see if we could find some support for it. And we did. We found it to be a really useful framework to help us understand. A um, couple of things to say, and I'm just going to go through each of the bits in, in a bit more detail and uh, tell you about what dominates the digital experience for learners at different points on this spectrum, okay? And how you can develop recommendations, things to do differently within your institution on the basis of this. But one of the, the things to say before I do that is what changed over three years. So this project ran from 2007 to 2010, and they found, a bit like us when we were doing learning experience research previously, is that we were expecting the intensive specialist enthusiast group to grow over that three years, but that isn't what happened. Actually, they got more mainstream, and the mainstream became even more pragmatic about their use of technology. Uh, so, um, for instance, by year three, they found that uh, learners who had very plentiful access to technology in the home talked about their use of technology as rather mundane, as necessary. I have to be on Facebook because everyone else is, not because I actually feel any connection with it or because I really want to be, that kind of thing. So I'll take you through the um, minority ends of the spectrum first and then maybe spend a bit of time with the majority in the middle. So we still have, and I'm sure you do too, uh, a proportion of uh, the communities that we serve who are unconnected and vulnerable. And I'm not sure, actually, those two terms should be together, but I'll say a bit about that. So um, the latest uh, Ofcom data that I could found, find from 2012, 91% of 16 to 24-year-olds have web access at home. That means 9% don't. 71% have a smartphone, 29% don't. Okay? So we're still dealing with a small minority of, of learners who are unconnected. And for these learners, family and personal circumstances really prevent ownership or access to technology and make it particularly difficult. And interestingly, this group of learners, if they're not having access at home, when you look at who's using the access that's provided by college, it's the people who don't have access at home aren't using it at college either. Okay? So just the provision of technology doesn't help this group. Um, 
And uh, we met some learners like this in, in our focus groups, and they said things like this quote that I've pulled out at the bottom here. Uh, these, this is the group who are waiting to be told how to use it, okay? Just providing Chromebooks, nice, easy-to-use Chromebooks, isn't enough to actually get them to use it. Their experience, so when you say, what's the learner experience? What's the learner experience of digital learning? For this group, they say it's dominated by issues of access. They're stuck on issues of access before they can move on. And things that work are the kind of targeted solutions which take note of their issues of access, use technologies that they're very familiar with, lots of one-to-one -one mentoring, lots of confidence building, those kinds of things. Okay? We found um, when we met learners who might be classed as vulnerable, and particularly learners with disabilities, they turned out to be some of our most sophisticated users of technology. Very experimental, very confident. So I'm not quite sure about the wording of the spectrum here. Certainly unconnected, vulnerable, I'm not sure. Let's go to the, um, the other end of the scale then. So for the uh, intensive and specialist enthusiasts, so these are the learners, the, the digital leaders who mobilize their personal digital literacy practices very easily between the different contexts of home and work and study and college. So they're able to negotiate that boundary land, that borderland between all those different contexts, okay? They don't need to keep them separate and they're able to transfer practices across. Now, we found, and uh, the, the Davis S. Out study as well found, this is maybe 10% of our learners. So, so our e-pioneers, as we used to call them, you know, 10%. They present themselves as highly engaged, highly adaptable users of technology. They often have a personal interest in it. They're taking IT or audio or media courses, something like that. Uh, they see this as a way forward for employment. Interestingly, a number of them said their parents and careers advisors had often tried to talk them out of it, but they saw this as a, a personal interest area. And their experience, when you say, well, what's the learner experience, as if there is one learner experience, but for this for learners on this part of the spectrum, their experience is dominated by the extent to which they are allowed, encouraged, supported, to transfer their practices across social and work and study contexts. So um, they find some things particularly challenging. So if the infrastructure isn't reliable and, reli and robust, for instance, they find that really challenging. Uh, if they're not allowed to bring their own device, if they're, if they're kicked off the Wi-Fi after an hour of inactive use or something, all those things they find really, really challenging. Um, and uh, they're really interesting group to study because uh, they learn from each other rather than from the teachers. They learn more from each other, this kind of thing they say. And they develop practices in one context which are really purposeful, they have really good ownership of them, and then they'll take them into their classes as well. The majority then, the ones uh, in the middle, I think the, the naming of these even is really interesting. Mainstream, certainly 80% or so of our students, but these are the pragmatists. Good access to technology, not particularly enthusiastic about its use, see technology as instrumental in achieving the goals that they need to. Now, when you talk to these, you say all sorts of different things, but I've just picked out this quote here, which was from an A-level student who, a uh, sociology teacher, was doing the flipped classroom thing. Okay, so that's what was going on in this case. So the lessons revolved around using YouTube because the lessons were on YouTube, and then you, you see that outside of school, and you bring it in, uh, and then you talk about it. So that's what was going on. And for these learners, when you say, well, what's the, what's the learner experience? For them, it is dominated by the issue of pedagogy, by the issue of it's tutor-led, it's institution-led. It's um, without creative teaching, these pragmatic learners use technology in rather superficial, uninteresting ways. They use technology for research, uh, by which I mean go they Google it. They use technology to improve the presentation of their work, okay, publisher, PowerPoint, um, and not really for terribly much else. So uh, there's obviously very clear recommendations here, particularly for FE, on um, building capability and confidence of teachers in using technology in order to have any impact on the experience of this, of this group. So putting that all together, where does it get us then? 
So this is the uh, spectrum that we picked out from our desk study, uh, which I've just shown you. Uh, this is what we can say about how they experience the digital environment. And uh, I'm often asked for one answer, what's the learner experience like in the 21st century? Well, I can't give one answer because it's different. And maybe this is a framework that helps us understand how it's different, how it's different for different people. So for the unconnected, it's, it's predominantly about access. For the majority of our learners, it's predominantly about course design, actually. Uh, and for the in intensive and specialists, it's primarily about what they're allowed to do and what they're banned from doing or what they find difficult to do. And so what we did is, is we took these kinds of findings with lots of examples of case studies um, out to the consultation events and we asked people to, to think about what supports and what challenges these learners, okay? So if you think about learners at different points in the spectrum and we get them to kind of think about, well, when are these, these learners best supported? And, and I've got a lot more than just a few, the few that I've put up here. And when are they challenged? And this is an exercise which I think it is really useful for institutions or course teams to undertake for themselves, okay? So if you take anything away from this talk, it's probably this slide, this framework, and the idea of thinking about, okay, where's the difference in my learners, right? So this, this is a framework you might be able to use, but you might have your own notions of difference. And actually, for these learners on the left, when are they most challenged? When are they best supported? What should we be doing? about it. Um, when we were talking to the, the learners in the uh, focus groups, they talked a lot, particularly the unconnected, the ones about access, about uh, we had initial induction and then we had nothing else. So there's certainly something there about ongoing support, ongoing assessment of skills, okay? Um, for the mainstream pragmatists, well, actually, their experience is very tutor-led at the moment, but we'd like to move them on a little bit from that and to be a little bit more self-directed. So talking to them about developing self-management skills and criticality skills and things that they can help them transfer their practices from one context to another is something that's particularly interesting. And for the, um, the intensive and specialist enthusiasts, they talk a lot in the focus groups about um, the, some of the things that they bring, bring to the classroom being devalued or dismissed. And so we need to turn that around and say, well, how are their practices valued? Uh, how can we not be so scared of some of the stuff that they're bringing in and be a bit more open about the conversations? So there might be something here you can do, you know, like a, an audit within your own program team or an audit, you know, within your, your campus or your institutional level or something like that. And I don't expect to move this, I've got it blown up in a minute, but this is the kind of structure that we used in the consultation event. So we started at the top here with learners are challenged when, you put in your columns the different, um, uh, we had the different areas of the spectrum and then uh, get people to generate ideas. So I've just, all I've done is just expanded one of these columns so that you can read it, but all the documents I'll show you are on the website in a minute. So I've just picked unconnected and vulnerable. So this is unconnected and vulnerable are challenged when. Now, I'm not saying this is the way it is. I'm saying these are the kinds of things you need to generate, okay? So within your context, within the types of courses that you teach, the learners that you have, what can you say about what challenges your unconnected and vulnerable? From your own um, studies that you've done and your own conversations that you've had with your learners, what can you say about this? We had a very interesting conversation about online assessment across the, all three of the levels, okay? So for the, um, for the mainstreams, they really like being able to submit from home, yeah? For the uh, intensive and specialists, well, their files are all too big and in the wrong format to be able to use it. <laughs> <laughs> and for the unconnected and vulnerable, it just makes them want to give up completely, right? So, how, so you take a service like that that we think we're being really good in providing and actually try and map it across the needs of all learners. So how do you provide a service like that in a way that it meets the needs of all learners, okay? Then we did the same again. Learners are supported when, again, I don't expect you to read all of this, but I'll show you where the files are, but I just picked out the other end of the extreme here, the right-hand column, the intensive and specialist enthusiasts. And I think one of the most interesting things here was about, um, they said, uh, in, the, in the focus groups particularly, that these learners were best supported when their lecturers weren't afraid to learn with them, okay? So the lecturers didn't, not feeling that they had to be ahead of the game all the time and then teaching the learners. 
for saying to the learners, okay, what do you know about this and how can we work together on it? And certainly one of the key themes that arose from the 220 learners that we spoke to in the focus groups was um, this thing about don't make assumptions about us, okay? Don't make assumptions about what we can do and what we can't do. We want to work with you. We want to work with the lecturers uh, if you can just ask us what we need. There was a real um, willingness to work collaboratively with the teachers and lecturers that I think uh, we weren't expecting. So these were some of the, the main overall findings from the focus groups. Um, and I think uh, the thing about assumptions, don't make assumptions about our skills levels, uh, continue giving us feedback all the way through, not just at initial induction, and engage us in a collaborative exercise um, so that we can work out how to make the best use of technology were really important things. So finally, then, I just wanted to uh, hint at some of the other findings from the study. So I've just given you, you know, one little uh, strand through our findings, just one little thing, which is about learner difference and hopefully a kind of framework or tool that you can go away and have a think about. But I'll just put up here our kind of main set of findings, which you can find in our, our project report, because there are obviously some other things there that you might want to think about. The, um, if you're interested... In, in knowing any more, and I'll put that slide back up again in a minute. Uh, if you go to the FE Digital Student site, in fact, if you just Google um, JISC Digital Student, you'll, you'll find your way there to this project, and you can see all our project reports and those support and challenge documents uh, that you can find as well. There's a Teenagers and Technology book that I've uh, referred to, and um, there's also some other information there on communities that I'm involved in, and I will put these slides up on SlideShare later today so you can find those. But I'll just leave that up and take any questions. Have, have anyone got any? How different do you think the profile might be in a HSE environment as opposed to an FE environment? I suspect the general concept is not that different that we need to think about meeting the needs. You know, when we're thinking about designing a course or providing a service, we need to think about all the different needs. We really expected going into FE to find more unconnected and vulnerable. That was our assumption, but actually it really, really wasn't. Um, when we've done uh, other work to look at how, experience, how expectations are formed and things, it's school is such an important determinant. And whether you go through to FE or HE, you have that common grounding of school so how technology is used in school, your previous educational experience, I think, is what kind of grounds your approach that you take to technology. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Could you go back? Yes. Back three slides. <laughs> Say when. Uh, so I just yeah, go forward, forward, forward. Uh, that one. You see the third one, the college culture? Yeah. Okay. That, that is where we're going. Mm-hmm. Orientation towards mobile BYOD loan devices. Yeah. Are you seeing that as a general trend as well? Yes, definitely. And it's partly um, the financial reality of not being able to provide enough kit to keep up with learning. You know, we can't keep the, uh, the IT labs, we can't keep them upgraded as frequently as the students would like them. So it's partly a financial um, reality. But also, it's about people have really personal connections to their technology and they like to use the technology that they're familiar with and the software that they're familiar with and it's giving people just a little bit more freedom about that. Yeah. It's about developing learners, supporting learners to develop their own personal practices that they'll take with them you know, through into life and work. That's what we really need to be concentrating on. Yeah. Okay. Well, just very briefly, how do you see that translating back into the actions of, of lecturers? Yeah, well, it's the mainstream, isn't it? So the, the lecturers are most important for the mainstream 80% of the learners, okay? Um, um, because at that stage, if you remember, the learners are fairly pragmatic, fairly instrumental in using their technology. So they might come in very familiar with technology, but not really thinking about how they're going to use it to support their study. And that's where the lecturers can really come, really have an important role to play to say, uh, well, this is uh, the role of technology in your course, 
in all sorts of ways. It's transactional, you know, it helps you to book a time to see your academic advisor, that kind of level. But it also is transformational in terms of connecting you with a global community of people within your, your discipline, for example. And learners tend not to have that understanding of how technology can be transformational without a creative teacher to help them. 